So hi and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled Feminist Writings. We'll begin with a new text today which is Iraqi Nights by Dunia Mikhail. So we just finished uh, the Yellow War paper in the last lecture and we saw the commonality between that and Silver Plus Tulips in terms of looking at the female subject in a very reified male medical space and how that you know, experience of verification uh, is articulated through different experiential uh, assertions of agency or the lack of it. Now in Iraqi Nights, which is a poem we we'll begin with today, we talk about a war situation and how the female voice emerges from that war situation. So we're talking about Iraq, uh, war-torn Iraq, this is Saddam Hussein's Iraq and even in the Iraq after that. Uh, and what's interesting in this poem is that how the contemporary order, the contemporary condition of Iraq is constantly connected uh, with the mythical conditions. Uh, so we have references to a mythical past, a prehistorical past. Uh, and that connection between the mythical past and the contemporary present uh, gives a very interesting temporal structure uh, to this poem and which really sort of feeds into the experiential voice emerging out of it. Uh, because what we see in the poem is uh, a voice of agency, a, a voice aspiring to get some agency and that aspirational quality is very much there. Uh, there's also a voice of nostalgia which wants to go back and resurrect and retrieve and recover uh, some of the glorious times in the past which are now, which are now gone. Uh, and so this aspirational quality and a nostalgic quality, the forward looking quality and a backward looking quality uh, are constantly connected to each other in a very interesting loop like structure uh, which makes this poem not just important for, from the perspective of feminist writings but also from the perspective of memory studies uh, because that's exactly how the memory works. I mean it's forward looking as well as backward looking. Uh, it moves forward in time as well as cutting back across time and how the connections are made is what makes the whole process of memory uh, a very complex cognitive condition. And of course when you have a poem like this uh, which talks about the cognitive condition we are looking at how uh, you know the whole process of defamiliarizing language uh, is operative over here and that's one of the key things about almost any great works of poetry, the process of defamiliarization. It defamiliarizes uh, the familiar world, uh, the very mundane world, the very mundane material world is defamiliarized into something else and you know, it could be mythical, it could be metaphorical and this constant transition uh, from the material to the metaphorical is what we see um, in almost all great works of poetry, uh, not least when you have a poem like this which emerges of a very strong political condition such as a war, uh, a war torn condition um, in Iraq for instance which is what the condition is over here. And also from a more literal superficial perspective of memory studies you find this is very much uh, a female voice, a voice aspiring for agency as I mentioned already uh, which is critiquing this war which is obviously a man-made condition, literally a man-made condition. Uh, it's about the greed of men, uh, the lust for power, uh, territorialization etc. And what happens to uh, the civilians, what happens to the uh, normal voices who don't want to be a part of it. Uh, people, uh, the, the poet, the speaker, the poet persona in the poem who happens to be the speaker you know, is among the many normal voices and you find the poem at the end, uh, by the time it will end, we will find it ends with an aspirational quality, it aspires for normalcy and normalcy becomes a desired condition uh, in a time of war uh, because everything is defamiliarized during the war. The, world, the everydayness as we know it is defamiliarized, is interrupted all the time and that interrupted quality uh, of war uh, is what makes it such a traumatic experience. So it's not just violence at a physical visceral level, it's also violence at an epistemic level, the world as you know it, at the violence of level of knowledge. Everything that you know around you changes, uh, the grocery store, uh, the common lanes, the playgrounds, the schools, everything changes during the war, everything becomes something else during the war, everything becomes uh, war objects or totemic signs during the war. So when the poem ends we find that the, the speaker persona, uh, she wants to go back and retrieve that condition where everything was just the way it always has been. So she wants the uh, return of everydayness. Uh, everyday reality back to the uh, contemporary condition of Iraq. But just to begin with this poem, we'll dive into the text right now, but just to begin with this poem we find this constant uh, connection between the mythical past, the prehistorical past and the contemporary present is what makes this poem very, very uh, interesting from a temporal perspective and that temporal perspective is very, very important uh, uh, for the purpose of our study because you know we keep saying in feminist writings how space is a very important uh, factor, how space generates identities 
or fractures identities. Uh, you know, we have the experience of claustrophobia, emancipation, uh, and, and all that's related to space and how does a subject situate herself in a particular space. So, for instance, if you take a look at silver plus tulips, we find it's very much a spatial uh, kind of a production of identity. I mean, she's in a very reified medical space and that uh, not just confines her, but also constricts her voice. And similarly, we find in the yellow wall paper, it's very, very special. And how we find towards the end of the story, uh, the, you know, she morphs into the yellow wall paper. I mean, she is essentially in the yellow wall paper in a very symbolic, uh, spatial kind of way. So over here as well, in Iraqi Nights by Dunia Mikhail, we find space is a very important issue because the space of Iraq, the space, the civilian space of Iraq is constantly a uh, defamiliarized. And that process, the experience of being defamiliarized is what gives this poem uh, such a magnificently moving voice, which is what we will hopefully tap as a movement of the poem. So this is Iraqi Nights by Dunia Mikhail. So I'll just dive into the text and open with the first stanza, which begins with this. In the first year of war, they played bride and groom and counted everything on their fingers. Their faces reflected in the river, the waves that swept away the faces before disappearing, and the names of newborn. So at the very beginning, we have this very domestic symbol of uh, you know, a man and a woman, presumably playing bride and groom, and counted everything on their fingers. So in the first year of war, when the war began, uh, they played bride and groom. So there's this ludic quality about the war which is being uh, underlined. So by ludic, obviously, I mean playful. Uh, there's a game that is being played, uh, a bride and groom game, which is a game between man and woman, uh, a very domestic game, a very playful kind of activity, which is happening at the first year of war. So, you know, and then we have uh, the, the illusion of counting everything on their fingers. Their faces reflected in the river, the waves that swept away the faces before disappearing. So we have this constant emergence of waves which are disappearing and swooping away the, the faces. So we have this domestic image of a man and woman playing a bride and groom game, and then you have this illusion to waves coming in and, and sweeping away those faces and disappearing. So this uh, recurrence of war, uh, the recurrence of violence in a war is something which is uh, hinted at immediately at the very beginning of the poem. Okay, before disappearing are the names of newborns. So the names of newborns disappear as well. So we find this very covert quality of violence which is being emphasized in the very opening stanza, uh, along with the ludic reference of you know, playing this game of bride and groom. Then a war grew up and invented a new game for them. Uh, the winner is the one who returns from the journey uh, alone, full of stories of the dead as the passing wings flutter over the broken trees. And now we find the question of agency creeps in very, very carefully because the war grew up. So there's an organic quality about the war which is being emphasized the way up. It's like an organism which grows uh, and not just grows, it just consumes uh, the human subjects around it. Because what we are told is the war invented a new game for them. So the war gave them a game. Uh, so we find in the beginning, uh, we have this presumably man and woman figure playing a game which they have invented, uh, or a traditional game which they have replicated uh, and are continuing to play. But then as the war grew up, the war gave them a game, uh, invented a game for them. Uh, and what kind of game is that? The winner is the one who returns from the journey alone, full of stories of the dead as the passing wings flutter over the broken trees. So the question of deadness comes in very, very clearly. So the winner is, and the war gave them a game, and what kind of game is that? It's a game where the winner comes back, uh, you know, is the only person who comes back, returns on a journey. Uh, and what kind of journey is that? It's a journey which has stories about the dead. So the war, you know, gave them that game. So it's a game about violence, a game about disappearance, a game about death. Uh, and it's a game about storytelling as well. But what kind of storytelling? Storytelling about people who are dead. A storytelling about loss. So, you know, the sense of abandonment, the sense of loss, the sense of violence, the sense of disappearance uh, is you know, very much there, palpably present at the very opening of the stanza, in the opening stanza of this poem. And who returns on the journey alone, full of stories of the dead, as the passing wings flutter over the broken trees. Another winner must tow the hills of dust so lightly that no one feels it. Another winner wears a necklace with half a metal heart for a pendant, uh, and the task to follow is to forget the other half. Uh, this is a very important uh, uh, point that I just want to spend a little bit of time on. The whole idea of forgetting the other half. So forgetting becomes a condition uh, during war. Uh, forgetting becomes a necessary cognitive condition during the war. Uh, and uh, part, of the, part of the package of being a winner, you know, because you know, there's constant reference to the winner. So who is the winner in the game that the war has given them? Uh, the winner is someone who comes back uh, from the war and with stories about the dead. 
A. The winner is the one who uh, can must tow the hills of dust. So what kind of hill is that? The hill of death, really. So when the people who are buried, presumably, at the hills of dust, so lightly that no one feels that. And now the winner wears a necklace with half a metal heart for a pendant. So obviously the reference is to, you know, injured soldiers of the war who come back with you know broken arms broken limbs uh, who come back you know, you know who are medicalized who wear artificial hearts uh, they are the winners because they come back from the war uh, so it's a very platonic idea of uh, war because you know this very famous quote of plato if you remember uh, only the dead have seen the end of war uh, and that obviously has been played with a little bit over here uh, the dead have seen have seen the end of war uh, but the winners uh, they come back undead uh, and they come back to tell the stories of the dead. So the very ontology of winning is something which is problematized away. So that we, we realize very soon the winner is not really the winner. Uh, people who come back from the world undead uh, are the survivors, uh, are the tra traumatized survivors. They're not, they're no winners in the world, which is what is being emphasized in the very beginning of the poem. And it's reference to people wearing metal heart for a pendant. Uh, and again, look at the uh, combination of the uh, uh, embellished uh, and the medical uh, in, a, in a very you know seamless kind of way. So the pendant away uh, is obviously an embellished metaphor, a metaphor of embellishment, uh, a luxury jewelry, for instance. But we know very well that the pendant away uh, is actually a metal heart uh, that has been given or transplanted uh, into the human body because of the trauma and violence of the war. Okay, and then we are told, uh, and the task to follow is to forget the other half. So forgetting becomes a necessary, a compulsory condition during the war. So that is something which is required, expected uh, of the survivors. So they need, they need to forget the other half, the half that dead, uh, that are dead, the half that is buried uh, in the hill, the half that is um, destroyed uh, and disappeared uh, due, uh, due to the war. So again, the whole idea of forgetting becomes compulsory activity. So you find uh, in the very beginning of the poem, we have this overt symbols of uh, violence as well as the covert symbols of violence. Uh, it's more covert at the moment, but we find that it gets more and more direct as the poem progresses. But what is also interesting is to see how the whole idea of war uh, is told to us in a very roundabout way. The whole, the whole report of the war is told to us in a very roundabout way, in a very defamiliarized way. So we don't really get right into the heart of the gory details of the war. But we see the, the replications of the war uh, told to us in very symbolically couched uh, terms. So that symbolically couched terms are what makes this uh, description actually more menacing, uh, more, more cold uh, in terms of the reportage that we are told, we are, we are getting out of the stanza. And then we are told, the war grew old and left the old letters, the calendars and newspapers to turn yellow with the news, with the numbers, with the names of the players. So we have this organic quality of growth that is there. So the war, war is born, the war becomes new, and you know, then people play around the war, they play bride and groom, and then the war grows old, uh, grew up, so it becomes more agentic in quality, and it acquires agency, and it takes away the agency from the human beings, and then it gives them a game. Uh, and that particular game is about, you know, the, whoever wins in that game comes back from the war, injured, bruised, and with stories about the dead people. And then we are told the war grew old, so it is an organic quality about the war. It's like an organism growing up uh, and decaying away with time. Uh, the war grew old and left the old letters, uh, the calendars and newspapers to turn yellow. Yellow being this very common symbol of John Day's uh, condition, uh, you know, a sort of decadent condition, uh, something which is decaying away with time, uh, to turn yellow with the news, with the numbers and the names of the players. So the news, numbers and names, so the alliterations are interesting because what is telling you dramatically uh, are the list of dead people, people who've lost not just their lives, but their loved ones, uh, their, their you know, aspirations, their um, you know, the material possessions, everything which have been taken away from them by the war. So, you know, the war has taken away everything from them uh, and the war grows old and the older it grows, the more um, it consumes from the people around them. So it has a consumptive quality about it. Uh, it is a decaying quality about it, it is a decadent quality about the war. And also what is more sinister is, a, is, is an organic quality about the war as well. And the fact that it's born and grows up and then grows old and begins to consume everything. It is a cannibalistic organic quality about the war which is being um, sort of emphasized in the very opening stanza. So at the very beginning we find this sense of the menace which is brooding uh, uh, in the poem and this very spectral presence of the war is it's actually a spectre 
uh, lurking around the entire landscape, uh, consuming the landscape uh, without really being talked of as directly. And this very indirect spectral quality of the wall is what makes it more menacing, is what makes it uh, more of a sinister organism uh, that is consuming the human beings, consuming the little lives around it, uh, you know, at different points of time. So that's the present condition that we we, we are given, we are sort of described uh, by the by the particular uh, stanza of this particular section. And now we cut back, uh, interestingly, into the mythical past and we see how the mythical past informs the present condition uh, in a very complex way and this constant uh, juxtaposition of the mythical prehistorical past and the present gory condition is what makes this poem temporally and spatial temporally very, very interesting in quality and which makes it uh, a very interesting poem from the perspective of memory studies as well, which I have already mentioned. So the second stanza tells us five centuries have passed since Cesarade told her tale. Cesarade being this archetypal storyteller as we know, uh, the female storyteller, the archetype uh, of the storytelling persona uh, who keeps telling stories which never grow old. Uh, you know, and you know, something which continues forever, Cesarade. Uh, five centuries have passed since Cesarade told her tales. So we talked about a mythical past, uh, you know, we talked about this archetypal condition of storytelling, uh, but that's something which has very much a part of the past. We, we are told that five centuries have passed since that happened. So there is a temporal quality which is given to us. Baghdad fell and they forced me to the underworld. I watch the shadows as a pass behind the wall. So you know this whole idea of I begins to become um, important over here. And we, we, we get a sense of I obviously as a, as a mythical figure, uh, a poetess of imagination, a poetess of inspiration uh, that the uh, speaker persona is assuming in this particular section. And this reference to Cesar Rade is important because you know the whole idea of Baghdad falling. Uh, I mean this could be because of a Mongol invasion, this could be because of American invasion. We're not told which invasion uh, exactly this is. But you know, we can guess, we can take any example, any invasion and that would work uh, equally well. And then uh, we are told they forced me to the underworld. Uh, I'll watch the shadows as a pass behind the wall. None looked like Tammuz. He would cross thousands of miles for the sake of a single cup of tea. Poured by my own hand, I feel the tea is growing cold. Cold tea is worse than death. So again, this is a very interesting combination of domestic metaphors and spectral, you know, otherworldly metaphors. We, we told, we given the reference of Tammuz, uh, who is a companion uh, of, uh, you know, Ishtar, who is a poet persona in this particular poem, uh, this particular section, and Ishtar being this goddess of inspiration and, uh, you know, the muse of inspiration, the muse of poetry, and Tammuz being uh, the companion of that particular uh, muse. And we are told that Tammuz would cross thousands of miles uh, for the sake of a single cup of tea. And the whole idea, this very hyperbolic quality about crossing thousands of miles is juxtaposed with this very domestic quality of consuming tea. So we have this mythical, hyperbolic, exaggerated, larger than life uh, narrative constantly uh, merging into this very domestic, mundane, uh, daily narrative. So the dailiness and the mythical quality are constantly uh, dialoguing with each other in this poem. And it's very much a spatio-temporal strategy because what it does is that it takes us to this mythical Baghdad uh, of Shezarade, Harun al-Rashid, uh, and then brings us back uh, to the contemporary Baghdad of American invasion, uh, war-torn Iraq, etc., dictatorship, fascism, and all the rest of it. And you know that juxtaposition is very interestingly done also by this constant dialogue logic quality between the mythical and the mundane. So we have Tammuz uh, who is a companion of Ishtar who crossed thousands of miles but then we are told he would come to have a single cup of tea. And a cup of tea is a very domestic metaphor. It's a part of the dailiness of life and that dailiness is also you know, constantly dramatized in this poem. It's very much part of the mythical narrative. So they're not really opposites of each other, the mythical and the daily. They supplement each other in a very organic way. And we find at the end of the poem the dailiness is what is aspired for. I mean, she wants to go back uh, and enjoy the dailiness of life, you know, the dailiness of going to a grocery store, of school, children going to school, of neighbors uh, talking to each other in streets without a fear of bombing. Uh, that dailiness becomes the aspirational quality of Baghdad uh, in this particular setting. Uh, and then we are told, I fear the tea is growing cold. Uh, cold tea is worse than death. So again, we find a very interesting combination between the, a very domestic mundane thing, a tea growing cold. We can't think of a more domestic image than that, can we? Uh, you know, it's about something which happens every day in you know, everyone's home, uh, making a cup of tea and then that tea, the cup of tea growing cold. Uh, it's a very daily common mundane phenomenon. But then that, that mundane quality about that particular section is sort of merged into uh, the sinister quality of death. And we're told that cold tea is worse than death. 
and obviously death uh, comes loaded with all kinds of images, archetypal images, uh, contemporary gory images, political images, etc. So again, the mythic method is interesting over here. Uh, the you know the very hyperbolic mythical past, uh, the very hyperbolic mythical condition, and the very domestic condition are constantly dialoguing with each other in this poem. So we move to the third stanza over here, which says, "I would not have found this cracked jar if it weren't for my loneliness." which sees gold in all the glitters, inside the jar is a magic plant that Gilgamesh never stopped looking for. So again, Gilgamesh is a Sumerian epic which has been referred to a, uh, and that again takes us back to a mythical past, uh, a prehistorical past as it were, where it talks about larger than life heroes and you know, monsters, uh, and it's something which is you know, glorious, heroic, noble, uh, and that nobility, that heroic quality of the past, uh, that larger than life quality about the mythical past is constantly merging uh, with the current contemporary decadent present. Uh, and this allusion to a cracked jar is important because a cracked jar becomes a symbol of you know, the brokenness uh, of real life, the brokenness of lived life. Because uh, a jar is obviously a, a space where you store things, uh, things that you like, things that, you, uh, things that nourish you, uh, things that you know, give you sustenance, meaning uh, in a domestic setting. And that cracked jar, the fact that it's been abandoned and decadent and it's destroyed by the reality, uh, becomes an allegorical symbol uh, of the cracking up of contemporary life, cracking up of you know, lived life, and cracking up of nourishment uh, to a large extent. And we're told that uh, I, you know, we, I found the crack jar because of my loneliness. And this loneliness has a cognitive condition, an existential condition, a political condition uh, created by the world, a sense of alienation uh, from everything around you, from everything that you know, everything that is meaning given. Uh, and that meaning given mechanism of normal life is, you know, is interrupted by the world. And like you said, among the many things which a world does, uh, it it creates obviously a sense of physical, visceral violence, but also epistemic violence. The world as you know it, uh, at the level of knowledge, that changes dramatically during the war. So the grocery store becomes something else, uh, you know, the school becomes something else, the lane that you know becomes something else. Uh, so everything is re-territorialized and defamiliarized during the war. And that sense of alienation emerges out of the re-territorialization and defamiliarization, which is what has been captured so poetically in this section. Right, so inside the jar is a magic plant that Gilgamesh never stopped looking for. So the magic plant of immortality, you know, the magic plant of you know, constant inspiration is what Gilgamesh looked for and that is found in this cracked jar in a very domestic setting that the, the speaker persona uh, discovers uh, out of her loneliness. Right, I'll show it to Tammuz when he comes and we'll journey as fast as light to all the continents of the world and all who smell it will be cured or freed I will know its secret. I don't want Tammuz to come too late to hear my urgent song. So again, the whole idea of calling out to companion, calling out to Tammuz uh, to come and you know be her companion and travel with her across the world. And uh, again, this very hyperbolic quality is interesting. Will travel, will journey as fast as light. So again, the whole idea, the whole aspiration to travel as fast as light, it has a mythical uh, hyperbolic quality to it. And we also told them that you know, we travel to all the continents of the world and all who smell it, this particular plant that I found in a, in a, in a cracked jar, all who smell it will be cured or freed um, and will or will know the secret. I don't want Tammuz to come too late to hear my urgent song. So this is Beckettian quality about the arrival of Tammuz, this constant deferral of the arrival of Tammuz who never really comes. Uh, and this constant waiting for a hope to come, this constant waiting for an optimism to come, which never really appears, uh, becomes a bit of a limbo state. But also, that limbo gives a sense of possible emancipation, the, the possibility of a possibility, uh, which is constantly deferred. So deferral or waiting becomes, and as we all know, you know, made famous by Beckett's Waiting for Godot, but at a philosophical, ontological level, waiting becomes uh, a combination of hopelessness and hopefulness. So we're waiting for something to come, which never comes, but you constantly wait for it uh, in a sense that you know, you know somewhere in your mind, perhaps you believe that if that comes, that you know, everything will be cured, everything will be emancipated. So we, co we continue to wait, despite the death row. Uh, and Tammuz never turns up, like Godot, Tammuz never turns up in this poem. Uh, but then that wait is what gives the speaker persona an aspirational quality, an optimism uh, to hold on to. Uh, as she continues to wait and continues to make plans of what she will do when Tammuz does arrive in the end. 
Uh, we, we're never quite sure if he will arrive in the end or not, but then we're told, we're given a list of things that she will do if he arrives. So we're told that you know, they'll journey together as far as it's light, again, very hyperbolic, very mythical, and to all the continents of the world, and all who smell it will, will, will travel with this magic plant, and all who smell it will be cured or freed, uh, and will know the secret of immortality or inspiration. And that is obviously a very utopian kind of desire, uh, which is based on this waiting. So when the waiting comes to an end, then this, will, this is what's going to happen. But the waiting continues to happen. And so that gives a, a sense of you know, co a combination of hopefulness and hopelessness, which is part of the ontological condition of waiting. Right? It combines both uh, sentiments together uh, in a very asymmetric way. Okay, and then of course we, we continue to get this information about what she will do when Tammuz does arrive uh, eventually. So the fourth stanza tells us when Tammuz comes, I'll also give him all the lists I made uh, to pass the time. So she's made a list of things and also the word list is interesting because uh, a list is a mundane metaphor. You make a grocery list for instance, uh, but then this mundane metaphor is very seamlessly mixed into the mythical register. So this constant combination of two different semantic registers, the mundane and the mythical, is what makes this poem spatio-temporally very complex in quality. Uh, so we are told when Tammuz comes, I also give him all the lists I made to pass the time. A list of food, of books, lost friends, favorite songs, a list of cities to see before one dies, a list of ordinary things with notes to prove that we are still alive. So, you know, and this is the beginning uh, of that point of the poem where ordinariness uh, becomes an aspirational quality in a what torn condition. You want to be ordinary, you want to be normal, you want to be daily uh, at a level that the world is taken away from completely. So, you know, all she wants, all that this poet persona wants is to become ordinary again, to do ordinary things like buying books and looking for friends, uh, playing favorite songs uh, and you know, making a list of cities that they must see before they die. Uh, these are very, very ordinary domestic daily aspirations, a very human micro level, very little things. But, you know, that list becomes very, very important. That's the reason why that list gets so seamlessly mixed or merged uh, into this mythical register. When Tammuz comes, his companion comes, when he comes, uh, I'll make a cup of tea for him. But when he comes, uh, I make a list of things that we'll do together. And of course, we don't know if that's ever going to happen. But this weight, this listing of things, this aspiration to do things together is what gives us a sense of hopefulness. Uh, and this lingering idea of hopefulness, this lingering presence of optimism, which never quite leaves this poem, uh, despite the war condition that it, it is situated in. Right, so this list of ordinary things uh, with notes, we make little notes to prove that we are still alive, despite the war condition, despite the defamiliarization, despite the re-territorialization, which the war has wrought uh, at different levels of violence, physical, epistemic, uh, visceral, and psychological. Right? And that's the list that you know, I'm making in order to become ordinary again when Tammuz does arrive. We'll have a cup of tea and we'll become ordinary again. We'll do ordinary things such as you know, looking for friends, reading books, playing favorite songs, and then uh, making a list of favorite cities which we'll see before we die. And that idea of ordinariness becomes a very, very optimistic quality. So there's a re-ontologization of ordinariness in the poem. Uh, ordinariness becomes an aspirational category or a, uh, uh, given the extraordinary condition that is what has created uh, out of defamiliarization and re -territorialization. So ordinariness becomes a utopian condition. I want to be ordinary again when the war ends, but will the war ever end? Will Tammuz come back and be my companion again? Uh, that obviously has no concrete response, but that waiting continues with a combination of hopefulness and hopelessness in a very Beckettian sense. Okay, so uh, the fifth stanza is very uh, synesthetic in quality. It combines different sensory perceptions, the sense of touch, the sense of hearing, the sense of sight, the sense of smell. They're all mixed together in very complex cognitive ways, which is something which we saw already uh, in some of the texts we have covered uh, so far. So for instance, we saw that dramatically done in a yellow wallpaper when, you know, at some point, if you remember, the poet persona says, I can smell the yellow. And that's very synesthetic. Uh, it's a very co complex cognitive condition where you can crisscross the senses in a way. It's a very heightened uh, sensory perception or sensory situation which can come out of an aberration or an epiphany or a combination of both, right? So we have a similar situation over here which is very synesthetic in quality. And we are told that the speaker says, it's as if I'm hearing music and the boats howl. And if I can smell the river, the lily, the fish, as if I'm touching the skies that fall from the words, I love you, 
as if I can see those tiny notes um, that are read over and over again, as if I'm living the lives of birds who bear nothing but their feathers. So this whole idea of touching different things, smelling different things, uh, acknowledging the love that she has, uh, becomes part of the you know, extraordinary aspiration in her war condition, which obviously she is denied. Uh, and she obviously becomes the every man, the every woman in a war on Iraq. Uh, and that voice of the everyman who wants to do little things, who wants to go back to ordinary things, uh, becomes very much part of the aspirational category that a poem continues to carry uh, and dramatize through different lyrical symbols uh, that we see. So, for instance, hearing music in the boat's hull, smelling the river, the lily, the fish, touching the skies, uh, the fall from the words, I love you. So again, look at the way the word, I love you, which is very, very human and emotional and sentimental and beautiful. And that is connected uh, to this massive image of the sky is falling. Uh, and again, this constant combination between two different registers of meaning, uh, the hyperbolic, large in the life and the domestic mundane is something which makes this poem so complex at a spatial temporal level. Uh, you can cut back to the myth cut into the present, look forward to the future, all in one sentence, uh, but just using symbols strategically, which the poem does. So at the level of craft, I think this is a magnificent poem in the sense that, you know, the control of craft is so perfect uh, by Dunya Mikhail. Because and not only is it a feminist poem, uh, it's you know as a poem it captures the condition, uh, the psychological condition, the political condition, the war-torn condition so well. And there's a degree of viscerality about the condition; you can feel it through your senses. But at the same time, there's this discursive quality about the poem as well that you know exactly what has conditioned this viscerality, the war, the greed of man, uh, and then you know all you need from this particular condition is you know, a return to ordinariness. Uh, you know, little things like saying I love you, little things like aspiring for a cup of tea, little things like making a list of books and, you know, favorite songs. And these little things that were just denied to the citizens, the human subjects during the war. And that's what makes this poem so aspirational and quality. And also the whole idea of re-ontologizing ordinariness that, you know, the ordinariness which you take for granted, which we consume and internalize every single day, that can be interrupted during the war. And, you know, and that interruption can create an aspiration to go back to the ordinariness, which is what this poem is all about, right? So, um, and the sixth stanza is, again, it's a continuation uh, of the mythical symbols. We have reference to Aladdin's lamb, for instance. The earth circled the sun once more, and not a cloud, nor wind, nor country passed through my eyes. My shadow, imprisoned in Aladdin's lamp, uh, mirrors the following. So, you know, again, the return of the mythical order is interesting. Over here. Aladdin's lamp comes back, but this is Saddam's Iraq we are talking about. And this constant mixing of the mythical and the present is, again, making it very special, temporally complex. So, what does a lamp show uh, in present Iraq? My shadow, imprisoned in Aladdin's lamp, mirrors the following. This is what it reflects um, that lamp. A picture of the world with you inside. Light passing through a needle's eye, scrollings akin to a cuneiform, hidden paths to the sun, dried clay, tranquil Ottoman pottery, and a huge pomegranate, its seeds scattered all over Uruk. So this is very, very mythical. Cuneiform is the first, you know, the, the, the material in which the first writing was done in Mesopotamia. Uh, so it goes back to the very beginning of writing, the, the very beginning of human civilization where words are put into writing, where emotions found words. Uh, and found letters, uh, which was what's happening and you know, what happened in that part of the world. So it goes back to the glorious mythical past uh, and resurrects it. But obviously, the, the idea is to contrast it uh, with the gory reality, the decadent reality of today. Uh, but this, this constantly nostalgic quality about the past is what gives a sense of optimism that maybe that can be resurrected uh, through ordinariness again. So let's go back and be ordinary again. Let's say things which are ordinary. Let's do things which are ordinary. Let's purchase things which are ordinary. And maybe through the ordinariness, we can go back to the extraordinary reality of the myth again. So we will pass. Uh, a picture of the world with you inside, so the very inclusive picture of the lover inside, uh, light passing through a needle's eye, scrollings akin to a cuneiform, hidden paths to the sun, dried clay, tranquil Ottoman pottery. So the tranquility of Ottoman pottery, which is obviously high art, uh, but the, the high art emerging out of tranquility is what is being emphasized over here, which is a complete contrast to the decadence emerging out of violence in the war. So it's a complete diametrical opposite to what is being experience at the present moment of time. And a huge pomegranate, its seeds scattered all over Uruk. So Uruk being the 
the mythical name of Iraq, uh, you know, the huge pomegranate uh, it sees capturing all over Uruk. It's a symbol of regeneration, symbol of birth, a uh, symbol of growth, fertility, uh, and of course that's juxtaposed along with a symbol of inspiration, creativity, and regeneration. So you have this very beautiful capsule of utopian images, uh, which are sort of conjured up by this epiphany and you know this is the aspirational quality that is desired uh, in the poem in terms of connecting back to the past, the mythical past. But now the final stanza with which the poem ends, which we will conclude with, we find that what is really aspired for is not the mythical past. What is really aspired for is the agency, the, the freedom to do ordinary things again uh, when the war closes, the freedom to be neighbors again, the freedom to go to school again, the freedom to buy, go to a grocery store again without the fear of bombardment, without fear of dying. Right? And that is the ordinary thing which is being aspired for again. So the mythical past appears as a very convenient subtext, but what is really aspired for is to go back and become normal again. So normalcy is what is aspired for again. And that is what I mean when I say the poem re-ontologizes ordinariness. Uh, it tells us ordinariness is not something we should take for granted. It's something which can go away when a war comes. Uh, so when you're in the middle of a war, all you can want uh, through the mythical aspiration is to go back and be ordinary again. And this is what the poem says with which it ends, the final stanza, which is the seventh stanza. In Iraq, after a thousand and one nights, someone will talk to someone else. Markets will open for regular customers. Small feet will tickle the giant feet of the tigress. Gulls will spread the wings and no one will fire at them. Women will walk the streets without looking back in fear. Men will give their real names without putting their lives at risk. Children will go to school and come home again. Chickens in the villages won't peck at human flesh on the grass. Disputes will take place without any explosives. A cloud will pass over cars heading to work as usual. A hand will wave to someone leaving or returning. The sunrise will be the same for those who wake and those who never will. And every moment something ordinary will happen under the sun. So, you know, this is beautiful and evocative, but if you look at the list of things, uh, these are things which we do every single day. Uh, going to school, talking to neighbors, waving at people we like, uh, and, you know, you know, doing different things as a community and also as individuals. And we realize when we read the section that these are things which are interrupted dramatically existentially during the war. So the whole idea of becoming ordinary again is what the poem aspires for. Uh, doing little things, doing micro things which make, which give meanings to us as human beings, as, you know, citizens sharing a space together as subjects and also as individuals. And that's what the poem wants to be, wants to return to uh, through this series of images. So if you take a look at the images again, you know, markets opening for regular customers, not for soldiers, not for veterans. Uh, you know, small feet will tickle the giant feet of tigress. So again, this combination of different scales of existence, tigress obviously being the river of Iraq, the giant feet of tigress will be tickled by small feet, children will play in the river. Uh, again, gulls will spread the wings without the fear of being shot at, right? So there'll be no soldiers to shoot the gulls uh, you know, when they spread the wings. Women will walk the streets without looking back in fear. There will be no paranoid woman uh, who would look back at fear. Men will give the real names without putting their lives at risk. Uh, you know, men will give the real names without you know, being captured, without fear of being captured, without fear of being interrogated or tortured. Children will go to school and come home again. So schools will be just schools again. They not become uh, you know, sites of destruction. They will not become sites of bombardment again. Chickens in the villages won't peck at human flesh. So you find, you know, this is what happens now. Chickens peck at human flesh as a reversal of the normal order uh, where chickens peck like vultures at human flesh, rotting human flesh, which are caused the destruction of the war on the grass. Disputes will take place without any explosives. So there will be no explosives, to, you know, to settle disputes. Uh, Disputes will take place normally, ordinary, you know, in a very ordinary, civil kind of way. A cloud will pass over cars heading to work as usual. There's a series of cars going to offices, and a cloud will pass over them, a normal cloud, not a bombed cloud. And there will be no bombing on the cars. The cars will just go to the offices and come back as usual. A hand will wave to someone leaving or returning. People will feel normal again. They will connect cognitively, existentially, emotionally to their neighbors, waving at them when they see them and you know, fearlessly again. And the final bit is a sunrise will be the same for those who wake and those who never will. So there'll be, there be no darkness, there'll be no cloud of bombs, there'll be no cloud of you know, mushrooms, uh, mushroom cloud of bombing which will happen in Iraq ever. There'll be normal sunrise and there'll be the same for people who wake and people who are dead normally, naturally. 
and so at every moment something ordinary will happen under the sun. So that's the aspiration with which the poem ends. We'll go back to being ordinary again, we'll repossess our ordinariness, we'll reown our ordinariness, do little things, say little things, make little lists and be normal subjects again. So you find, you know, this is how the poem ends and like I said, uh, this covers so many boxes. I mean, from a feminist perspective, this is a very strong feminist critique of the male greed which creates the war, greed for territorialization, lust for power, and all the rest of it. But also, from a memory studies perspective, this is so much about you know, going back to time and then looking forward to time as well. So we find you know, this is a very key component in memory studies. When you remember something, we don't really go back all the time. We also look forward. So part of memory is also aspirational and quality. When you remember something of the past, we also aspire something for the future. That's part of the same narrative of remembering. Uh, and that's something which we know from theories of memory. And that's something which this poem does so well. It keeps going back to the past. It keeps resurrecting uh, the mythical past. But what it's actually doing is it's looking forward to a future where those memories will come back again and consolidate uh, into more contemporary forms. And that consolidation into contemporary forms is what the poem aspires for through its you know, aspiration for ordinariness again. Right? So that is what the poem is all about. And we can reread it over and over again. But th these are narratives which we will sort of operate with for the purpose of this particular course. So we conclude Iraqi Nights with that and we'll move on to new texts in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.